praise God. Say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> well, we were, we were discussing what new creation is. And we were emphasizing this morning the new opportunities. It's not new creature. It's new creation. And uh, how we should be, because our lives have been enriched by God through Jesus Christ, how our lives should also be enriching others. Now let's look at uh, the primary object of redemption, which is sonship. John 1 verse 12. John 1 verse 12. <clears throat> but as many as received him, to them he gave the right. I think in the King James Version, use the word power. Other translation reads authority. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. This is the object of uh, redemption. And notice in the, in the NASB, gave them the right or the authority. Okay? Sonship is a right. It's like the moment you become a citizen of the U.S., voting is a right. And uh, other benefits that comes along with U.S. citizenship. So the same thing is given to us. But look at the language. But as many as received him. Who does the receiving in the first place? Who received who? <laughs> who received who? Us. We receive Jesus. Are you sure about that? Now, if we receive Jesus, say you have a party in your house and you issue an invitation, attend to my party. Who will receive who? The host. The one who makes the invitation. Right? So as many as received him, to them he gave the right. So, I invited you to the house, so I receive you. So, I tell you, welcome. I am giving you now the right to enjoy my house and the party. So, who received who? <laughs> well, look at the language of the scripture. For as many as receive him, him gives the right. There's a contradiction in term there, right? Are you seeing that? You have to start looking at the scriptures this way when you're having your devotion. Well, actually, it's a relative term. Who gives the invitation? Those of you who are tired and weary, come. Okay. Knock, and it will be open to you. Who gives the invitation? So who receives who? Jesus actually receives us. You see, it's a relative term. That's why, because Jesus received us, the mo he issues the welcome. Those of you who are tired and weary, come. Right? Those of you who are thirsty, come. Those of you who are hungry, come. So he's giving the invitation. We heard the invitation. It's like the parable of, uh, what's the parable? Is that the party, the wedding ba banquet. Who gave the invitation? The host. So here, when you say, as many as receive him, actually, it's receiving his invitation. The one who issued the invitation is actually God, is Jesus Christ. We received his invitation. Therefore, we are not saying, Lord, I receive you as my Savior. That's, of course, the proper term. I am now giving you the right to become my father. We don't do that, right? But we receive, therefore we give. But he receives, what we receive is his invitation by faith. As many as receive him, receive his invitation. Then he gives them the right. You have now the right to enter the kingdom and to enjoy what is in the kingdom. And, and I think we have, we have to clarify it in our heads because I think it contributes to the thought processing that we have that after we get born again, we earn everything. We don't earn anything, okay? We cooperate in faith, 
but everything is freely given to us. Everything. Say everything. That pertains to what? Life and godliness. Everything does not include death and ungodliness. You see? What life? Everything that sustains eternal life. What is eternal life? What is eternal life? The word in Greek is what we normally refer to Zoe, the daughter of uh, Jack. <laughs> Zoe, yeah. It's the God kind of life. It's eternal life. When did we receive eternal life? When do we receive eternal life? When we become born again, right? Therefore, eternal life is a quality of life. It's a God kind of life. It can't be sustained naturally. It can only be sustained spiritually. And so that is the power that we were given. That's enriching our lives, our discussion this morning. Okay? So now he gave us the right to become children of God. We don't earn it. Now, of course, there are actions of faith. But this is the object of redemption. God wants us into his fold because in the beginning genesis god was creating a family now this brings us back to the original event that when man sinned there was a change in location the <coughs> when god exiled adam and eve to the east of eden the physical the physical movement was symbolic of the real separation that took place. The presence of God was in Eden. Now it was guarded. There were, <clears throat> there were uh, angels that, uh, that guarded cherubim, that, that guarded the garden. And man cannot access it anymore. And uh, do you, did you ever wonder what happened to Eden? Hmm? She, he said she is celebrating. <laughs> that's that's this mom. <laughs> well, some people, some, the, the rabbis think that God took it back to heaven. Well, I know that the tree of life in the garden was taken by God because we will eat from that in Revelation. Remember, we will eat from the fruit of the the tree of life. So somehow that portion was was taken by God. I don't know how. How it happened, it's not important for me to know. Why do I know it's not important for me to know? The Bible doesn't say so. So it's, 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 uh, that knowledge is too wonderful, I believe. It's one of those things that uh, it's, it's going to be very difficult for your mind to understand. So now, there was a change in location. So redemption means now that we are, being, we are brought back to that location. Again, the kingdom of God is the rule of God. We have no more Eden right now. Except Sister Eden. Okay. We, 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 have no more, we have no more Garden of Eden where the, the Euphrates River meets with the, with the, with the Tigris River. No, none, none of that anymore. But what we have entered in is the reign of God. Because God eventually will convert the whole earth as a Garden of Eden. And so there was a change. Look at... Uh, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 13. For he rescued us, look, look at this, from the domain of darkness. What is a domain? It's a kingdom. Dominion is a, a domain dominated by a king. So, for he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. Look at this. He rescued us. What tense of the verb is that? So it happened in the past. Where did you get saved? Wherever you get saved. If you got saved in Chicago, in the Philippines, that's where you get saved. Have you noticed, for example, if you are in the church? and there was an altar call, or you are in a hospital, or wherever you are when you receive the Lord your Savior, you never change location. You're still there. Right? If you're in the house, you're still in your house. 
But the Bible says at that, at that specific time, when you accepted the invitation, you were immediately rescued. That means we were in bondage. We were redeemed. That means we were taken captive. Before being born again, we were under the domain or the dominion of darkness. That's why it is wrong to admire or idolize people who are not born again. Because you are idolizing those who are under the dominion of darkness. There are no good thieves. Robin Hood is a myth. Okay? Thieves, thievery is sin. No good thieves. That's under the dominion of darkness. When you don't have Christ, you're under the dominion of darkness. Now, after we, we receive his invitation, and then transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. So after we get born again, we were rescued from the domain of darkness. And where are we placed now? Where? Kingdom of his beloved son. So where are we now? We are now in the kingdom of God. So when are we going to enter the kingdom of God? We are already there. You see that? But some Christians, they're thinking the moment they go to heaven, they're entering the kingdom of God. No, the moment you get born again, you were rescued. We never see, we did not see the physical transfer. If you get born again, wherever you get born again, you're still there. But spiritually or positionally, there was a change in your spiritual location. We are no longer under the dominion of when was the last time you guys paid taxes in the Philippines? Anybody here? Well, when was the last time you paid taxes in the Philippines? I never, I never paid taxes in the Philippines again after I moved here. Why? Well, I was transferred. I do not follow the traffic rules in the Philippines. I do not follow any more laws in the Philippines. I mean, when I became dual citizen, I got this right back to vote. I found out you don't cast your vote twice. You are removed from the voting list. So the Philippine consular office, after I did not vote twice, why I did not vote twice, I don't like any of the candidates. I mean, I, I read there is this boxer named Manny Pacquiao running for center. I said, what in the world is this, you know? What is he going to do? Punch corruption in the Philippines? So I could not choose any candidate. I refused to vote. Uh, I, I just happen to know some of the backgrounds of some of the candidates. I just don't like them. So I did not vote. Now, if you voted for them, bless your heart, you voted for them. But after twice refusing to vote, they put my name on the list. They, they come up with the list of, uh, disqualified voters. I read my name there. So immediately after I became a citizen again of the Philippines, I was disqualified from voting. You know. Did anybody knock on my door? Did I get penalized? No. When I pay taxes, I pay taxes in the U.S. Why? I am now under the dominion of the U.S. I don't need to give the Philippines energy. Now I became a dual citizen. I still don't pay taxes. You know why? <laughs> because, number one, I have no income in the Philippines and there is no double taxation. I can't be paying taxes in the U.S. and on the same income pay tax in the Philippines. No double taxation in international law. Okay? That means I am totally under the dominion of the U.S. Now think about this. What if I... I, I remember I got caught, uh, not speeding, swerving. I, I, I didn't realize there's a swerving law in the Philippines. You know? And then, oh, traffic. And then there is this road in, uh, I forgot which road is this, Larem's old house in, in, in uh, Maryville. What's that? 
Maryville, 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 yeah, Maryville subdivision. And there's this road that is two-way. I didn't realize that around 1 p.m. it becomes one-way. So I entered into the one-way and I saw all these bears coming towards me. I immediately flashed and honked my horn. They're all coming to me and the police came to me and said, what are you doing? I said, I remember this morning this two-way. And they asked for my license. You know what I did? I gave them my U.S. license. I said, well, I'm a missionary. I said, and this morning this is this is two way. Now it becomes one way. And of course they're looking for a bribe. I said, I'm a, mis- I'm a pastor. I'm a missionary. And they're looking for a bribe. I'm a pastor. <laughs> Take my license. You know what they did? They gave me back my license. What did they do? Drive away. Thank you. <laughs> I am no, <laughs> I am, I am no longer under the dominion because I don't have to suffer the way. I think I'm, I'm going to renew my lines right now. I was told by Brother Willie, he waited for one year before his, they changed the rules right now. I thought under the 30, it's going to get better, it's going to get faster. It's going to get faster than the turtle, you know. Uh, because now, before I will go the, they don't call it DMD, LTO, and I walk out with the license. Now, six months to one year. Yeah, what kind of garbage is that, you know? Well, I'm going to have to do it because we are doing legal transactions as a church in the Philippines, so I guess I'm going to apply out without the actual license. But I have all of these things, information, and so I don't feel, in fact, whenever I travel, I always have $100 in my pocket. Because my instru- anything happened, make sure you have money to get a taxi cab to go to the U.S. Embassy. Why? Anything happen in the Philippines, I'm going to go to the U.S. Embassy. Guess what the U.S. Embassy will do to me? They will see my blue passport. They will airlift me probably to Singapore or to Korea. Why? I am an American citizen. I'm not governed by that law. Now, the reason why it's important is this. The moment you get born again, this is where we are not conscious of. There is a transfer that took place. You are no longer under the dominion of darkness. You are now in the kingdom of God. We are not going to enter. We already entered. So how come I I do not know what's happening? Because of ignorance. Do you know that you don't have to fall into temptation? You don't have to follow Satan. You don't have to follow the dictates of the flesh. Now don't raise your hands. Okay, Don't raise your hands. I beg you don't raise your hands. How many of you, when you went back to the Philippines, you tried to bribe, bribe before the customs? You've got $10 or $1 so that you'll... Uh, don't raise your hands because I know some Christians do that. What happened is they are under the dominion of the U.S. When they walk in, they immediately place themselves under the dominion. Listen, me being in the Philippines that did not suspend my being a U.S. citizen. That's why Jesus said, I am not praying that you take them out of this world, but that you protect them. You keep them. That's a military term, meaning you put a hedge of protection around them. Wherever we go, the U.S. citizens, wherever we go, theoretically the full force and resources of the United States is behind us. What is amazing, of course, is when you begin to see those, the prisoner from Venezuela, the prisoner from uh, North Korea, when they, when they were set free because of the negotiations. Because now you have the president, you have the secretary of state, you have the full force of the U.S. government demanding these American citizens be set free. Of course, our problem is Obama allowed them to stay there. You know? But that is, that is when you begin to realize the full force of your authority. We are no longer under the dominion of darkness. Satan comes along and begins to laugh at you and say, I'm going to kill your wife, I'm going to kill your husband, I'm going to kill your parents. You look at him and say, you have no right. I'm not under your dominion. I told you about what happened when my wife was in the uh, emergency room and said, are you going to get married when, when, when I die? You know? And I look at her, hey, listen, before you are under the authority of your father, who happens to be not born again, I told my wife. I said, now that we are married, you are under my authority. You're under my supervision. I said, you're not going to die young. God never told me that. And she told me, ang yabang mo naman. 
Why? Because she is carnally minded during that time. She doesn't realize the spiritual authority that she is now under. My whole family is under my leadership spiritually. Ask my boys, the big ones. I, never, I will never relinquish that. You know, she, if I'm still alive when DJ is 50, I'm not relinquishing that spiritual headship in my family. I don't care if Joseph joins the Air Force and from second lieutenant he becomes sergeant or something like that, you know. I don't care if he has, he has guns and everything else. I still have authority over him. He's my son. Some people, some parents relinquish that authority. I have no plans of relinquishing that authority. I'm not going to permit Satan to abuse my family. I'm not going to let that happen. You see? Because you begin to understand your spiritual authority. Now, do you think Jesus, after rescuing us from darkness, Satan can prowl around us and play with us? What, what, what will you do? Have you seen that uh, video of this police officer on her day off in New York? Have you seen this video? It's a phenomenal video. Here's this thief. He pulled out a gun, and this, this woman in pink is uh, having her day off. She's got a handbag with, I think, a 9 millimeter pistol or a 22 milli uh, caliber pistol, you know. And, and the guy pointed the gun like this. He's got a revolver, and he was grabbing, I think, a handbag. The day of police officer back up a little bit. You know how women, they have this, they don't have handbags, they have a depository or something, you know. <laughs> so this, this, guy, this lady pulled out a, revo a, 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 I think a Glock from her, from her purse, and at blank point, just boom! The, the, and she got nervous a little bit, shot him twice more. Yeah. And then rolled him over and uh, held him until the police came. They rushed him to the hospital where he died. You know. It's important that when you shot somebody, they die in the hospital. Uh, it's a lesser legal. <laughs> How do I know these things? I just read, you know. <laughs> and I know these things. Don't let them die in your hands. Let them die in the hospital. That's how you do it. Well, well uh, they, they, he died. But now she's being praised as a hero. Because she is an authority. She's a police officer. She's not going to let this thief steal her day. Possible, possibly killing civilians and possibly her child who was there that she was picking up. Not going to let it happen. Our problem is we don't understand their authority. With open eyes, the enemy is stealing from us and we watch, and we pray, oh Lord. And God is looking at you and say, what are you praying about? I gave you power to thread on serpents and scorpions. You know, when Joseph was going to school, any of my kids going to school and they're having problems, I don't hold their hands saying, oh, let's pray. I don't do that. God already gave me authority. I give them instructions. Oh, somebody's bullying me. Okay, Joseph, this is what you do. First you warn, then you hit. And when you hit, you hit hard. Make sure he remembers. Well, he forgot my instruction. As he warned, he hit. But I forgive him. It's okay. I gave him that go signal because he was telling me, oh, because you told me don't fight. Well, I gave him go. After he did that, because he operated under my authority, I went to school and said, I am the father of Joseph. I'm a pastor. I want to meet that boy that he punched, that boy's father. I'm going to counsel him. <laughs> Well, nobody showed up. You see? But I'm not about to let that happen. That's why now as children of God, in our eyes, you are going to your place of work and there are abuses there. There are persecution. And you think you are under that. No, you have been transferred. You know what persecution means? What, what, is persec what does persecution mean? What's the other word for, to persecute? John, you're Greek. To pursue, to what? To pursue. Very good. I'm going to give you a C plus there. You know? <laughs> because you took your one. 
To persecute means to pursue. When you are pursuing, what does it mean? You're chasing. <laughs> Very good. You are behind. <laughs> when you're pursuing, you are behind. You are not on the same location. That's why you're pursuing. So when we are being persecuted, it's because we are ahead. We think we are behind. No, you can't be pursued if you are behind. You will eat their dust. The reason why we are being persecuted is because they are way behind. And they, they not only want to stop us, they want to destroy us, so we will not be behind them. You know why Christians are being persecuted? Because no matter what darkness does, they are still behind us. That's why they're pursuing us. They're never ahead of us. They're still we are in the kingdom of light. If you are in darkness, you're going to grow up around in darkness. You don't know what, what, what to do. Sonship is very important because of the change in location. Transfer, the word transfer means removed. Now, this is easy to understand. It was not just uh, a declaration that we were redeemed. We know that we change location. I, I think I would like, I would like to think of uh, political asylums. Uh, I have a friend who's a political asylum. He, he, she, she was uh, an informant for the NBI in the Philippines against money laundering of the mafia in the Philippines, and so. And so they were trying to kill her. And because she was a state witness for the Republic of the Philippines, there is no place in the Philippines where she will be safe. So the State Department in the Philippines worked out an asylum for her. She was asked, where do you want to go? Uh, we have a diplomatic ties with, with uh, the U.S., Canada. No, of course, if you're going to go on asylum, where do you want to go? You're not going to say. I'm going to go to Nigeria. You know, you don't do that. <laughs> Something is wrong with your head. Uh, you say, I'm going to <laughs> go to U.S. or uh, There's no such, such diplomatic relationship we have with Switzerland. So you, you, you go to the U.S., you go to Canada. So she chose Canada because uh, she has relatives in Canada. The State Department then, together with the National Bureau of Investigation, they did all the work. They got her an asylum. She flew to Canada as an immigrant. She still works in, in Canada right now. Her husband works for Ford Motors in Canada. You see? What happened? She was rescued, change of location. She will never be pursued anymore in Canada. Different law. You see? This is what happened to us. Physically, what we have to overcome is this mental block. A lot of Christians still think they are victims. No, things have changed. Have you noticed, guys, that after you receive your green card or after you receive your uh, blue passport, when you are leaving the Philippines, you, you go to the immigration line, and you say, sir, yes, ma'am. My tongue is slipping. <laughs> Not only that, it's so loud. I hear a lot of Fili people, and, and me and my wife will be, what are these Fili Filipinos doing? They are speaking English, wrong grammar, you know. And, I said, and they're very loud. Why? Because they have blue passport. They don't crawl anymore. Um, Mom, uh, I'll just give them a passport and smile. Yeah. Then you go. You don't need to chit chat. You have a difference right now. See? But you can go in there and be deceived. Now you know why, why the Philippine government cannot just touch us. Because there is a treaty between the U.S. and the Philippines, they cannot just pursue an American citizen. In fact, people are wondering how come those GI soldiers, when they did crime in the Philippines, they're being taken because that's part of the agreement. The Philippine government has the burden of proof that the crime is so heinous, they have to be tried in the Philippines because it will affect the unrest in the Philippines. But ordinary crimes, they can be pulled out by the U.S. government from the Philippine soils. You see, that's our right. Satan cannot just touch us, nor our families, nor anything that belongs to us. Problem? Fear. Fear 
gives him access. You know what a bully is? A bully has, is somebody who's got nothing on you except fear. Huh? Except fear. I, I've, I've seen husbands big you know, with tattoo. And then their little wife comes and say, it's time for you to do the dishes. <laughs> All it is is fear. And sometimes you look, what? Pwede mong tirisin yung misis mo. You know, but fear. Have you ever been afraid of your wife? I remember when, when, when we first got married, Anne will be very upset with me. During the time I was heavy in, in, in workout, I was younger, and, she, and she'll be hitting me in my, in my chest. And I'll just stand there and look at her and say, be, be careful, you may hurt yourself. Now I don't do that anymore. Be careful, you may kill me, you know. <laughs> Back then, she was 92 pounds, you know. <laughs> that was the Old Testament. <laughs> we are now living in the New Testament. So she will be, and she will be running. She doesn't want to talk to me. She'll be running. I'll put my foot on that door, and she will not be able to do anything about it. She won't be able to close it. You know, I don't, I don't cry, cry around the apartment. Oh, please. No, it's... You just don't do it. But sometimes it's funny. Because when you have a weaker vessel trying to hurt you, it's just like, jo it's a, well, James is, is stronger than her during that time. I mean, how, how heavy is James? Maybe, maybe James is 192 pounds or something. <laughs> James, DJ hits harder. You know, than my wife back then. So she tries to, hey, be careful. And she will, huh? But then fear, fear can make you, can paralyze you. Right? It can paralyze you. And your enemy can smell fear. They can see that. And so some people just surrender their authority. R remember, remember the movie, I like this movie. Shawshank Redemption. Re remember that uh, dialogue after the librarian committed, what did she, he committed suicide. Did he commit suicide? No, he did not commit suicide. That was after he went out, right? He put somebody under the knife, remember that? Um, and Morgan Freeman said this, he said, when you first get in here, you want to get out, you want to fight. He said, but then, funny, he said, these walls become your home, they become familiar. He said, you've been here for 20 years. You have been, what's the term? Institutionalized. That you, it's already your home, you don't want to get out. That's why when the librarian left, he could not adjust to the new world. He hung himself. He was institutionalized that he could not imagine living outside of prison. Now listen to me. That is our problem. We, don't, we have been institutionalized by darkness. We don't know how to live in victory. That's why temptation comes, I'm going to fall. You have been institutionalized. Your mind is defeated already. The enemy shows its face, you are defeated. But some people are full of hope, they are full of faith. Even under the most abject situation, they see hope. And they can believe their way out. They have not been institutionalized. You know. My favorite food to this day is still Sinigang. I was never institutionalized by the U.S. in food. I still don't like American food. Yeah, nothing, if you're used to American food, for you it's very delicious. For me, no. You know, I, I think <laughs> best food is still Asian food. I like Filipino, Chinese, and Japanese in that order. Now, some of us are so used to falling into temptation, to being defeated, to giving up the moment the first sign of defeat shows up, we give up already. You have been institutionalized by defeat. You have to overcome that. 
I've been trained, teaching this church for over 20 years. And I'm telling you, some people just could not get it. That you can live in victory. All things are deliberately forgotten by God. He will, justification is a state just as if you never sin. The better definition I read is this. Just as if sin never happened to you. That's justification. But again, some of us are so used to failure. We, hey, we are children of, children of God already. We are no longer in the kingdom of darkness. We are now in the kingdom of God. This is now the God rules in this domain. I'm still on this earth, but wherever I am, the kingdom of God is there. Wherever you are, the kingdom of God is there. But you've got to overcome your mind on that one. You've got to overcome it. That's why you will encounter some impossible situations wherein naturally there's no hope. But spiritually there's still hope. Because we are infused now with the kingdom of God. We cannot get institutionalized in sin. Every time you look at that sin, have you watched horror movies? When I first, when I first saw horror movies, it was still black and white, so even the blood is black, you know. Uh, it, was, it was a fearful thing. You, you're a little kid. Our apartment is up and down. Here you call it first floor, second floor. We call it up and down, you know. Why you go up and you go down? It's more logical, huh? I mean, it's one house. So up and down. Well, the thing is, the down is the kitchen. It's the darkest. And because we are eight siblings, we could not fit in the up. My kuya, who already have work, comes home at around 10 p.m., by the way, where I live, by the, by the time it's 8, 9 p.m., it's dark. Yeah. No street lights, nothing. Only dog barks. Yeah. And those dogs can bark, I mean. And uh, my, my parents will tell me, you and your kuya will be sleeping down. <laughs> Boy, it was dark. And I don't know about these Filipino parents. They are so full of you know what I mean. They, why are you laughing? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Fearful stories, horror stories, uh, as one, right? I don't know why they, they make their children scared. And after making me scared, they, they take pleasure in telling me, now go down and sleep there. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Guess what? You, you have to justify in your mind why you will not be eaten by vampires and everything. A little noise. What was that? Well, those are rodents. There are plenty in the house, you know. Uh, and so, you, they really scare you to death. But, but we are thinking, I begin to, I begin to realize, I said, what, what kind of movies are this? Black, and then long, long, uh, Call it, saber teeth, you know. <laughs> you know, there was a shift. I don't know. I was still very young. There was a shift that took place in my head. I think it's the grace of God. A shift took place. I begin to look at those pictures as comedic. You know how I look at horror stories right now? It's a comedy. Yeah. My, my wife will be screaming all over the place. I said, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> It's really comedic, you know. It, it becomes like a comedy to me. Now, I wasn't born again yet, but it becomes a comedy to me. I, after that, no fear of horror movies. It's just, it's a comedy. Yeah. Some of you, it's not a comedy. For, for you, it's just a movie. It's a reality, you know. <laughs> Go with me. Go with me upstairs. Go with me. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll tell my kids, go get my stuff upstairs. Oh, it's dark. <laughs> <laughs> For me, it's a comedy. But there was a switch in my mind. It's, I've got to look at it that way. You know what the Bible says? 
One day we're, no, we are not. I am not. Uh, only those going to hell will, do, will, will, will experience this. Everybody who goes to hell, the worst part in hell is reserved for Satan. Okay? They will look at him and they will say, is this the man who deceived the nations? Now look at that statement. They will not say, is this the fallen demon? They will look at him and say, is this the man who had this situation? He just looked like a man. Yeah. By the way, if you read your Bible, when angels appear to Abraham, how they look like? Men. And now for the first time in hell, their eyes will be open. Is this the man? You know, hell, hell is already hot. But I can imagine those unbelievers, they'll be knocking their head off. I allow this worm to deceive me. I was so afraid of him. He looks like us. Is this the man who deceived the nations? Now, we are given that vision right now. We are giving undue credit to the enemy of our soul. He's a defeated foe. And he has no authority over us. None. You know. No authority over us. I, I hope you can get this. Sickness and disease have no authority over you. Well, some of you are claiming it. It's in your family. Enjoy it. I'm not going to enjoy it. Why? Because I have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. In the kingdom of God, Sickness is taken care of. You don't have to be afraid of that. In the kingdom of God. Now it takes a while for some to understand that. Failure is not part of kingdom rule. There is no kingdom rule that says you fail. No, failure is not an option. There are no poor people in the kingdom of God. I was telling you that this morning. No rich people in heaven. Everybody equal. So if you are in the kingdom of God, you are not poor in the sight of God. Now you can live poor and not take advantage of what is available for you. Remember, redemption is free. You enter into the kingdom of God, all the goodies that you see is free. Everything that pertains to life of godliness is given by God. And this is where the renewal of mind comes very important. Now, to take advantage of this or to participate in this, you are given a new identity. There is no other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. That's Acts, right? Where is Acts? I forgot, but it's in Acts. What? Acts what? Don't whisper it. I'm going to give you a D. <laughs> okay. <laughs> There's no other name. Given under a moment whereby we must be saved. We are given a new name. Why, why, why is it that a name is very important? Do you know that, for example, you are coming from the Philippines, you hate your name? The moment you swear in as an American citizen, you can change that name. Yeah, you can change that name. Anne overlooked that. If, if she remembered that when we were sworn in, she said, I should have changed it to just Anne. You know, because her name is, is Editha or Anne Edith. So she said, I should just have changed it to Anne. I said, we forgot. But a lot of people have changed their name. New identity, they changed their name. Do you know that if you change your name, it, it changes your identity? There is a, a thing going on right now. People are overlooking that, including Christians, the changing of names when a person gets married. You know why some, why some women will never submit to their husbands now, especially in new marriages? It's no longer a mandate for you to change your name. You can keep your name. Now, if you keep your name, you're under the same authority. Now, listen. When I was in the kingdom of darkness, I am one. I am a child of the devil. By the way, in the Bible, 
There are no last names. There are no last names. Jesus, the carpenter. Because for 18 years, he was a carpenter, right? Jesus, son of Joseph. Son of Joseph is not his last name. Identify, son of Joseph, the carpenter. The moment he entered the ministry, he's got a new change of identity. Jesus, the what? No, they don't call him the Christ. Come on, what did you see in the Bible? <laughs> what? Jesus, who? The teacher. <laughs> he was known as a teacher. Nobody call him Jesus the Messiah. No, nobody call him that. Uh, are we reading the same Bible, guys? I just want to make sure. You know. I know the, the two blind men call him Jesus, son of David. That is important, the connotation of son of David. But he was never called Jesus the Messiah. It was an argument back then. Okay? But he was no longer known as Jesus the carpenter because he is now doing the work of somebody anointed. You need help? Go to the anointed one. You need teaching? Go to the rabbi. No longer known as a carpenter. He shed off the title. He's no longer doing that. He's no longer making tables. He's no longer making chairs. He's no longer building houses. No longer doing that. He's now healing people, teaching, preaching the gospel. New identity. Therefore, he never took his hammer again. Why? He's got a new identity. The moment we get born again, we are no longer our name, child of the devil. Under the authority of the devil. We are, no, we are now our name, child of God. To them he gave right to become children of God. Therefore, I am now under the authority of my heavenly father. I am no longer under the authority of of the devil. Can you imagine in the law of adoption? Of course, they're changing the law. If I adopted DJ, for example, at uh, the age of 13, okay? I guess she's, how old are you now? 12. You're 12 years old. Okay, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to make sure, okay? So at the age of 13, I adopted her. Now that is, for example, her father, Whatever she, he says, he does. Now I adopted her. I change her name to Nationalis. All the documents now is Nationalis. So her dad, her ex dad, called and said, DJ, can you come over here and do the dishes? And she immediately says to me, Papa, can I go to? Papa, and do the dishes. I said, oh, oh, Papa, Papa, who? I am your Papa. Oh, my, 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 pa, my Papa. The other, no, you have no other Papa. I am your Papa. Well, he called me. Who cares? You don't. You don't have to go when he calls. I am your father now. Can she go? Of course she can. Why? Because she still has an attachment. Now, in the natural world, it could be that he is really a loving father and he just give her up for adoption because she could, he could not really provide and he's very sick. You know? So there is an attachment. But there is no reason for us to be attached to Satan. I have no attachment. He calls, who cares? I listen to my father now. That's why I like the story of Smith Wigglesworth. Remember when during winter he was co he covered himself with, with blanket, and there was a noise in his room. He took off his blanket and he saw Satan standing in his room. This is Smith Wigglesworth. He looked at him. Oh, it's just Satan. He went back to sleep. <laughs> I like that story. He did not shave. He did. Oh, it's just Satan. Now the devil will. Because it, it, it depends on when you get born again. Say you have been serving the devil for 30 years. There's a lot of institutional mind there. We have been following him all these years. And to overcome that is something else. 
Did I overcome all my sins the first day I got born again? No, I'm still overcoming some of it, even today. My wife says I still am very temperamental. I don't know if she's telling the truth, but I have to believe her. She's my wife. You know, I've got no choice. She feeds me. That means if I am really still temperamental, am I temperamental, DJ? Okay, no, you see. How old are you? Exactly, you see. <laughs> but if I'm still very temperamental, that means I'm still overcoming that. But I'm not under Satan. Yeah. yeah. We, we, we were, I think we were in the mall, and there's this guy doing something around DJ, and I look at him, and DJ gets scared. Not at the guy, at me. <laughs> he said, she said, what's wrong? I said, why? Why are you so angry? I said, somebody is prowling around you. You know. Did you hear what I said? Somebody was prowling around her. So don't prowl. Because she's my daughter. I'm going to protect her. You see? But what I'm saying is the renewal of the mind will take a lifetime. But positionally, boy oh boy, I'm still not used to being an American citizen. There's a lot of things in America that I don't understand. There's still a lot of ways that is very Filipino. I, do you think I feel at home in America? Not not in my wildest in my, I don't feel at home here to this day. Yeah, I just don't. I, uh, sometimes, wife, where do you feel at home? I said, I think I just want to go to heaven. I want to be done. There's, there's a lot of things here that I don't like. There's a lot of things in the films I just don't like. I don't like the fact that faith is not being taken seriously nowadays. That People can just simply badmouth people on television and call questions and unbelievers. All kind. I, I just don't like that. I don't like the way the media is going. I don't like politics in this country. There's a lot of things that I like in this country, but there's a lot of things I, I, I will never get used to. Why? Because they are obscene. Yeah. They are obscene. Anything that is obscene, I, I, I will not get used to. I will never get used to it. Because I'm now under the kingdom of God. That's what adoption means. You know why? Because if you have been adopted, your new family would love it if you look just like them. Remember that, uh, that movie, The Blind Side, when they were thinking of legal, becoming a legal guardian to this big giant, uh, this middle-line bucker? Uh, what's his name? Orr? Michael Orr? And this is what uh, the lady says. What do you think about being, becoming part of this family? What was his answer? I thought I already was. And there was a smile on everybody's face. Now, can you imagine that if, if for example, your mindset is you're a child of God. Everything that we need, he provides every problem that we get ourselves into, the Bible says, the righteous man has many troubles and the Lord delivers from them all. Now some of these troubles we cause, but who cares? If, if my kids get sick because they were playing basketball outside and it rained, they were sweating like pigs. And then it rained. And they never went inside. They get sick. I'm not going to look at my child coming back inside the house shriveling. And I will look at them and say, you stupid fool. I told you the moment it rains, get inside. Now you're sick. Suffer. No. I see him sick. I'm going to find me medicine. I'm going to apply it to him. I'm going to get a doctor for him. It is his problem. He caused the problem. But because I am his father, I'll take care of this. This is the final thing. Amen? 
So God delivers the righteous from all of his trouble, including troubles he cost himself. That's how good God is. That's the nature of adoption. We have a new father now. Our, our Heavenly Father never runs out of power. He never runs out of healing. He never runs out of provision. But we just have to see it. You know, we just have to see it. This new identity is, is, a, is after the fall. We are identified with Adam in the fall. Now we are identified with Christ in the resurrection. Now, all, all that I have been discussing with you sounds easy but difficult to live by. Why? Because this comes as a revelation to our inner man. I'm telling you last, last Friday about what I'm working on for, I don't know if I'll teach it here. I hope I can teach it here before I teach it in the Philippines. Um, it's called Transforming Faith. Deforming unbelief in a progressive world. I've been, I have 19 pages already written down. And uh, I'm working on it because I've just realized a lot of people say they live by faith. But I look at the scriptures, when you live by faith, you are being transformed from glory to glory. It's positive. What about if a Christian, you see a Christian being, being growing, and then suddenly they drop. They become deteriorating. They are no longer living by faith. They are now living in unbelief or fear. Because faith will transform you into the likeness of Jesus Christ. Unbelief will deform you. Look, when Samson was living by faith, he's growing from strength to strength. When he started disobedience, that's unbelief. Rebelliousness, that's unbelief. He got for himself a whore. He got for himself, he got himself into trouble and he lost his strength. A weak a weak Samson is a deformed Samson. A Samson with a shaved hair, deformed Samson. Because when you think of Samson, what are you thinking? Long hair. What if Samson shows up to you and there is no hair? No, you're not Samson. He has been deformed. Samson. Uh, Samsung, no Wi-Fi signal. <laughs> now, if, Samsung, if, if you tell Samson, hey, Samson, can you please help? We, we have a party. Uh, bring up some tables. And Samson said, ah, Samson, Samson, kapadyan. <laughs> Palitan mo na yung pangalan mo. Di ba? Anong papangalatin? Okay, yeah. Galaxy. Nahawa ka na. <laughs> yeah. Well, because he doesn't live up to, to our expectation. That is Samson. Have you noticed when you see a, a preacher backslide? I thought he's a preacher. Huh? Right? You see a Christian, very. Then you see him going to a nightclub. I, I thought he's a Christian. Right? You see his uh, picture in the Facebook, almost naked. I thought he's born again. What happened? You see him deform. You see him deform. So either you are living by faith, or you're being and transformed into the image of Christ. Or you are living in unbelief. A person living by faith will continue to be transformed from glory to glory, and that means you begin to understand more by revelation who you are in Christ Jesus. That's why I mean they they tried to kill this little guy named Paul. Paul means little, so he must be a little guy. They tried to kill him. Put him in jail, shipwreck, beat him three times. They could not kill him. Then he got old. You know why they could not kill him? Because he said, I'm not ready yet. Remember at one time he was writing and said, you know, I am in a crossroad right now. I'm in betwixt, he said. Because God is now allowing me to go home. Remember that passage? But he said, I'm in a dilemma right now. It'll be great if I go home now. As if God has given him permission. Hey, hey Paul, what do you want? You want to go home now? I'm giving you a choice. You want to go home now? And Paul says, wait a minute, Lord. Wow. 
I have seen the third heaven. I can go home now. But then he looked at the believers. He said, ah, but they still need me. I still have a lot of revelations. I have not shared them. Anyway, and he said, hey, it's beneficial for me that I stay. I'm going to stay a little while. They put him in jail some more until finally they, he went to Rome and they put him in jail. It was, winter was coming. It was late fall. Some people say it's, it's late October, uh, maybe November. So the, 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 the weather is getting cold. And he wrote, and you know, when, when you're old and it's cold, man, you, you don't want to stay around. I've seen other people. Now remember that Paul is not married also. You know. He's got no sons or daughter to, to uh, rejoice in, no wife. So at that point, it was, you know more people commit suicide during winter? Yeah. More people commit suicide during winter. And so he, he wrote to Timothy. I said, Timothy, please come. Bring Mark. Before winter, it's cold. Bring extra blanket. Right? And then this is what he said. By the way, bring the scrolls. Bring, bring the parchments. Bring my books. I said, hurry up. And here's the way you have to hurry up. He said, this. He said, I am done. Finally, he decided it's time for me to go. Earlier, he said, not that he said, I'm, I'm ready to go, I'm old. I like that story. He said, I'm old, I'm ready to go. He said, come, before winter. Shortly thereafter, Nero took his head off. You know why, why they finally killed him? Because he said, it is finished, I'm done. Now he said, now a crown is waiting for me. There's a reward. This is, there's a reward waiting for me. And this is what said, nothing more here on earth. No reason to hang around. Yeah. I, I, I told the Lord I want to see my grandkids. But I told the Lord after I'm, I'm done with all of that, I want to go home. There, there's nothing here that will hold me. God, I'm not Paul. If God tells me to say you're done, I'm not, I'm not extending my stay. I have no plans. Nothing here holds me. Yeah. Except maybe perhaps my family. But the moment, the moment I'm done, I'm, I'm going home. You know, I just hope it's not winter. I don't like winter. <laughs> Some of you like winter. You're crazy. You know? I don't like winter. I like summer. Yeah. But our minds have to be transformed. We, 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 you and I have to realize that we are on earth, but we are in the kingdom of God. We are in the kingdom of God. And everything that we need for life and godliness is, is ready to be given to us. Oh, we are still sin-minded. First time I landed in the U.S., I had my, my Philippine passport stamped how do you call it? An I, 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 I 90? I 94. Oh, 1994, you know? I, I nine, is it I 94 or 294? I 94. Yeah. The stay, right? So I've got something like three months or something like that. And it's stamped on my, on my green passport. And I was in Hawaii. And I need to fly to Virginia. And, and I keep looking at Pastor Kinsa and I said, will they interview me at the gate? Because I remember when I first landed in the U.S., in Hawaii, it was over one hour. Pastor Kinsa almost left me in the airport. He thought I never made it. They gave me a hard time in my, in my uh, entry in the U.S., in Hawaii. And so I, that's, that's traumatizing, you know. Uh, they, they asked me, who are you? <laughs> I mean, I look like a refugee, according to Pastor Gene. What, what can you do, you know? <laughs> Who are you? I said, I'm a pastor, and I, had, I was sick on my way to Japan, and, and uh, I lost my voice, and I don't look like a preacher at all. I don't know how a preacher looks like. I, I don't look like one at all. Why are they inviting you? There are so many Filipino ministers here. And I remember saying to the immigration officer, 
Well, there are a lot of Filipino pastors here. They don't have what I have. That's what I said. What do you mean? They don't have my experience. I said, they don't have my, my training. They don't have that, I said. That's maybe because I was upset already. I said, they don't have that. They invited me. I'm the one they invited, I said. And the guy just looked at me and said, how much money do you have? <laughs> I have over $200. <laughs> so I, I said, I, I have enough. And Are you going to work here? Well, they said they're going to give me love offering. I'm a pastor. They give love offering when they preach. Oh, I understand that. Ask me some. Ask me to quote scriptures. Uh, you better know your Bible. So. <laughs> and my problem is those immigration officers, they memorize King James, you know. These are Elizabethan people, you know. But, of course, I memorized my verse from King James Bible, so I was able to give it all to them. Finally, they let me out. So the, I was traumatized. So when I, mean, I was about to fly to New York first and then to Virginia Beach, I was telling Pastor Kinsa, will they interview me? And he keeps telling me this. Jose, you're in. I said, what do you mean? You don't need to bring your passport. Do you, do you guys, when you first came here, always bring your passport? And then suddenly you overcome that. You don't bring your passport anymore. You realize you're in. And Pastor Kinsa keeps telling me, Jose, you're in. You can travel anywhere in the U.S. Nobody will ask for your passport. You're in. You can drive anywhere in the mainland. You're in. And it doesn't get it. So I was always bring my passport. Always bring my passport. Then I get my driver's license. And I started forgetting to bring my passport. Why? Because... I realized I can lose my passport, <laughs> so I keep it in the house. Well, when I got so used to it, I went to San Diego in the border. <laughs> so I, I boarded this bus, and in the middle of the road, some, some immigration patrol, he stopped the bus. And I look at my friend, what's going on? Oh, if you have no documents, they'll deport you. I said, what? <laughs> now that I forgot my passport? <laughs> and and, and uh, two women were taken off the bus. I, I saw it. Now I have this recollection, the memory, immigration interview. Oh, man. You know. And the immigration officer came to me and said, identification, please. Passport. Why? I look like Mexican. The, 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 the Spanish race, you know. I gave him my school ID and my driver's license. You are supposed to bring your passport all the time, sir. I said, yeah, but I can lose it. But I remember I was no longer, after that, I overcome, I was no longer, uh, sir, I can, I can lose my passport, so I keep it home. You want to, you, you call my school, they'll tell you, I'm, here's, here's my ID. But you're supposed to bring your passport. The law says, if you are not a legal uh, person here, you're supposed to always bring your passport. I said, I understand, sir, but I don't want to lose my passport. Now I'm reasoning because there's more confidence. And the immigration officer says, okay, next time you bring your passport. Yes, sir, thank you. And they let me go. Guess what? I never returned to San Diego after that. <laughs> what are you, nuts? <laughs> never, you know. <laughs> Went San Fernando Valley and all of those places, but did not return to San Diego. I don't want those border police. But now I can go there. I have my blue passport. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? But I have to overcome it in my mind. But Pastor King said, keep telling me, you're in. You're in. And listen, you are in the kingdom of God already. Get used to it. You're in. Satan shows its, his face. You rebuke him in the name of Jesus. You are now a citizen of the kingdom. That's part of your redemption. You have needs. Ask the Father. He'll give it to you. You're in trouble, ask the Father. He'll deliver you from all your troubles. But you've got to realize that. Now that comes as a form of revelation. Revelation is not information. Information is in the head. Not because you have information means you get it. There is a certain assurance when you know. When you know. There's something that I like about the police all the time. If I'm lost, I ask the police. Some people are allergic of the police. I'm not. I've always told my kids, the police is your friend. You know, 
I've always told them that. You're in trouble, you find a police, go to the police. I get lost, I'm driving, I look for a police. They, they, because part of the uh, training is to know all the blacks, wherever they are assigned. I asked the police. One time I got lost in Seattle, Washington, and I saw this uh, state trooper giving a ticket to another driver. So I pulled over and I approached, and the, the police said, Stop it! <laughs> Turn out you can't disturb them when they're giving tickets, you know. Wait in the car! And he was not nice. <laughs> Wait in the car, sir! They call you sir, but they scream at you. <laughs> so I stay in the car. After that, he said, I'm sorry if I scream at you, but I don't know if you are part of that guy and you have a gun. So that's standard procedure. What do you need? He's still angry. What do you need? I said, I'm lost. Where's the address? And he looked at this. I said, you follow me. And I followed him and he brought me to the address. You see? Why? Because I'm in. I'm in. I, I can still make mistakes and I'm still making but I'm in. I have the Holy Spirit inside. I have the Word of God. I have my Heavenly Father. I have ministering angels around me. I have, I have you. I have the family. I have the church. I'm in. Amen. You're in. Hallelujah. Praise God.